He was one of the most influential and talented entertainers the world has ever seen, but he was also one of the most complex. Generous and a loyal friend, champion of the underdog, a devoted family man, but he was also a womanizer. He was volatile, he was loudmouthed, and he was a tough guy. He lived a life on the edge, full of excitement, danger, and passion. So how did this skinny Italian kid from New Jersey become an international superstar and the world's first true multimedia artist? Well, in this episode of Biographics, we go behind the veneer to get up close and personal with the chairman of the board. Francis Albert Sinatra was born on December 12, 1915, in Hoboken, New Jersey. He was the only child of Italian immigrants Martin and Dolly Sinatra. As such, he was pampered by his parents, who lavished the best of what they could afford on their son. Still, little Frankie grew up lonely and alone. Martin Sinatra was a down-to-earth, easygoing, and hard-working city fireman. His mother was just the opposite, driven, involved in political issues, and proving herself the driving force of the family. She belonged to every organization in Hoboken and had a reputation as an extremely dominating character. While both of his parents worked, young Frank learned to look after himself. If he wasn't home alone, he'd be out wandering the neighborhood, where he quickly discovered how to become street smart. He grew up in a world of prohibition, bootleggers, and speakeasies. School was never a priority for the teenage Frank. He would often skip class to hang out in pool halls, boxing gyms, and on street corners. He soon developed a reputation as a stubborn, ornery kid who never backed down. Often the subject of racial taunts, he would never let an insult pass. A friend recalled that once he and Frank were walking down the street when someone said, Hey, you little wop! to Frank. His friend told him to keep on walking, but an enraged Frank blurted out, I'm gonna walk all over his face. The only problem was that Frank didn't really know how to fight, and he subsequently got beaten to a pulp. When his friend asked him whether it was worth it, he replied, Hell yeah, he'll never call me a wop again. However, two days later the same thing happened. Same guy, same result. By the age of 16, Frank had ditched school altogether. He worked at a series of odd jobs, including as a dock worker and a newspaper boy, but he often got bored and would quit a solid job after just a few weeks. When he walked out on a job working in the refrigeration units of cargo ships, his father had had enough. He referred to his son as a quitter and told him, if you want to be a bum, go somewhere else and be a bum. Frank didn't have to be told twice. He packed up his few belongings in a suitcase and took the train to New York City. By now, he had set his sights on making it as a singer. But no doors opened for the skinny Italian kid. He couldn't find any employment at all, let alone a singing gig. With nowhere to stay and no money for food, he headed home. Outwardly, Dolly mocked her son's singing ambitions, referring to him as Mr. Big Shot before smacking him on the head. But behind the scenes, she began visiting clubs and asking managers to give a boy a chance. This resulted in a short-term gig in a Hoboken club. But the job it didn't last. Frank got in a fight with the proprietor and was shown the door. When he was 17, Dolly and Marty lent Frank $65 so that he could buy a portable address system and sheet music arrangements. This put him a step ahead of other aspiring club performers. Frank then later began collecting orchestra he later explained his strategy. Bands needed them. I had them. If the local orchestra wanted to use my arrangements, and they always did because I had a large and up-to-the-minute collection, they had to take singer Sinatra too. In this way, Frank managed to establish a foothold in the local club scene. His hero was Bing Crosby, and he tried to copy the Crosby sound. But when he noticed virtually every other singer out there was doing the same thing, he made the decision to establish his own unique sound. In the summer of 1934, the 18-year-old Frank met 17-year-old Nancy Carol Barbato. She came from a poor family in Jersey City in New Jersey. Nancy was sitting on her front porch doing her nails when Frank walked up to her with a ukulele in his hand. His opening line was, Yo, what about me? I could use a manicure too. The spark was lit, and the romance blossomed over the next four years. They lived one town apart, and Frank would frequently take the bus to visit and date Nancy. During these years, Frank was building his singing experience. Most gigs would pay around $2 a night. Sometimes he performed at roadhouses for nothing more than a sandwich or a box of cigarettes. Frank's first break came on September 8, 1935, when he auditioned for a spot on the NBC radio show Major Bose and his original Amateur Hour. This show was broadcast live from the Capitol Theater in New York City. Frank teamed up with a group called The Three Flashes, and they became the Hoboken Four. They performed the Big Crosby hit Shine and won a spot on the show, which was 
sort of a 1930s forerunner to American Idol. Listeners phoned in to vote for their favorite act, and the Hoboken Four proved so popular that Major Bose invited them to return several times. However, the radio show appearances didn't lead to any lasting success. Frank returned to Hoboken and soon found himself once again begging for jobs anywhere he could find them. In 1939, Frank and Nancy they were married. Not long after that, Frank was singing in a club called The Rustic Cabin. In the audience was Harry James, a big band's leader, who was auditioning for a lead singer. James was impressed with Frank's way of talking a lyric. He invited Sinatra to audition the next day. Although there were a lot of others who showed up for the job, when Frank opened his mouth, the matter it was settled. He made his debut with the Harry James Band on June 30, 1939, at the Hippodrome Theatre in Baltimore. The rest of that summer and into the fall, he toured with the band to enthusiastic audiences. By 1940, Sinatra's popularity it was growing steadily. Then he changed bands midstream, jumping at the chance to sign on with the more famous Tommy Dorsey Orchestra. The deal that Frank struck, though, was hardly in his favor. He would give up a third of his earnings for life, plus 10% for Tommy's agents. But all that young Frank, who had recently become a father, wanted was to sing and be famous. And besides, he would end up with more each week than he was getting with the old band. With this band, Frank traveled across the country, and he ended up in Hollywood, California. In 1942, the band, with Sinatra out front, made a cameo in the MGM movie Ship Ahoy. With the band behind him, Frank had built up his profile. He appeared on the radio, in concert halls, on TV, and in the movies. By the end of 1942, he was one of the most well-known singers in the country, and he had replaced Bing Crosby as Billboard's top band vocalist and cut his first record with the band. By the end of 1942, Frank had made up his mind to go it alone. He was clearly the star attraction of the Tommy Dorsey band, so while they may have needed him, he was more than able to hold an audience by himself. When he told Dorsey of his intentions, the band leader was furious. But Frank was determined, and finally Dorsey relented. He did insist, however, that the contract for a third of Sinatra's earnings would remain in place. Frank decided that he would worry about that contract later. For now, he would get out before Dorsey changed his mind. Sinatra made his solo debut on his 27th birthday, December 12, 1942. In the audience that night was Bob Whiteman, manager of the Paramount Theatre. He was so impressed that he asked Benny Goodman, the King of Swing, if he minded having Frank on a bill with him at the Paramount. Goodman's response was, who the hell is Frank Sinatra? Well, he would soon find out. Sinatra's appearances at the Paramount made history. It was the start of the type of hysteria epitomized by screaming and fainting girls that would later greet Elvis and the Beatles. When Frank hit the stage, the theater erupted with wild scenes that had never been seen before. In 1944, with his popularity absolutely soaring, Frank became a father for a second time. Frank Sinatra Jr. joined older sister Nancy at home while their father's star kept ascending. His record sales topped the billings, and he was the most requested voice on the radio. With the end of World War II, Sinatra's fame rose to yet another level. He was contracted by Hollywood to star in a series of musicals, each more popular than the last. Yet, in his personal life, things were starting to unravel. He was away from home so much that he hardly saw his wife and children. Then, in 1947, Frank met and fell in love with the beautiful and glamorous actress Ava Gardner. The two began a very public affair, which lost Sinatra quite a lot of popularity among the older demographic. At the same time, the 31-year-old crooner's voice was beginning to show signs of strain, and he was also being attacked by mainstream media outlets for his support of liberal causes. It was said that his fight against segregation was communist-inspired. Reporters also began claiming that he dodged the draft during the war. Leading the print assault on Sinatra was reporter Lee Mortimer. On April 8, 1947, the two men came face to face at Ciro's nightclub in Hollywood. Frank went straight up to the reporter and called him a fruit and then proceeded to use him as a punching bag. Frank's bodyguards quickly broke it up with Sinatra yelling, Next time I see you, I'll kill you, you little degenerate. Mortimer had Frank arrested and charged with assault and battery. The charge resulted in Sinatra's gun permit being revoked. Mortimer later sued for $250,000 and the case was eventually settled for $9,000. Sinatra never seemed to appreciate that his choice of associates could impact his career. In 1947, not long after he beat up on Mortimer, he went to Havana to meet with the mobster boss, Lucky Luciano. This mob connection was to stick with him for the rest of his life. Despite the affair with Eve Gardner, Nancy Sinatra stuck by her husband's side. She gave birth to a third child, Christina, on Father's Day in 1948. But the new addition did not bring Frank back into the family fold. His fascination with Ava was greater than ever. Unlike Nancy, Ava could match him drink for drink, cigarette for cigarette, and tantrum for tantrum. They were an ideal, hard-living couple. 
That hard living, though, it had a price. In 1949, Frank's voice gave out. That, combined with his public reaction to his outrageous affair, led to plummeting record sales and chart numbers. His radio show was dropped, and MGM cancelled his movie contract. It looked like the show was over for the man who had been called The Voice. In 1951, Nancy finally divorced from Frank. In short order, Sinatra married Ava Gardner. He had formalized his love life, but it seemed there was nothing he could do to resurrect his failing career. The public had simply become disenchanted with him, viewing him as a washed-up has-been. It was during his period of hardship in the early 1950s that Sinatra read a book called From Here to Eternity by James Jones. When he learned that a movie version was being planned, he became convinced that this could be his road back to the top. He set his sights on securing the role of Private Angelo Maggio. Frank secured an audition and then proceeded to convince the movie's producers that he was Maggio. He won the part, and he gave the performance of his life. Sinatra won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. The following month, he signed a recording contract with Capitol Records, and his career was back on track. It appeared that losing his fame and then clawing it back had changed Sinatra as a singer. He now wore his heart on his sleeve, sharing in his performances his inner struggles. He became the first and the best musical storyteller, and it was this ability that brought him the male audience that he had never had before. In Sinatra, they saw the tender tough guy that they wanted to be. Sinatra's marriage to Ava Gardner was tumultuous, and it ended in divorce in 1957, but his career was going from strength to strength. By the late 1950s, he was well and truly back on top. His album Come Fly With Me was number one. It was on the charts for an impressive 71 weeks. At the same time, his movie career was also hitting new heights. In The Man with the Golden Arm, he gave an extraordinary performance as a heroin-addicted misfit. The 1960s then saw an emergence of a new kind of popular music, rock and roll. Realizing that he couldn't ignore it, Sinatra tried to accommodate by bringing out up-tempo albums. In the early 60s, Sinatra also became a staunch supporter of John F. Kennedy. However, Frank had maintained his association with key mob figures. Attorney General Robert Kennedy was concerned that Sinatra brought these underworld criminal figures too close to the president. He managed to sever the relationship between JFK and Sinatra. Sinatra's last great movie role was 1962's The Manchurian Candidate, in which he played a U.S. Army officer, Bennett Marco. After that, he appeared to become bored with movies and developed a reputation as a troublemaker on the set. His attention had switched to Las Vegas, the new gambling capital of the nation. There, he and his buddies became known as the Rat Pack. Along with Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Peter Lawford, and Joey Bishop, Sinatra performed a mixture of stand-up comedy and lounge music at the best casinos in town. Then, in December of 1963, Sinatra's fun-loving existence was jarringly interrupted when his 19-year-old son, Frank Jr., was kidnapped and held for $240,000 ransom. Sinatra appealed to Robert Kennedy, who called in the FBI. The ransom was paid, Frank Jr. was released, and the kidnappers promptly caught, with most of the ransom being returned. In 1964, while filming Von Ryan's Express, Sinatra noticed a young actress named Mia Farrow hanging around the set. The star of a popular nighttime soap opera, Farrow, at just 19, soon became Sinatra constant companion. The 30-year age gap provided plenty for the gossip columnists to get their teeth into. In 1965, the 50-year-old singer won an Emmy for the best television special of the year. The following year, he recorded one of his most popular albums of all time, Strangers in the Night. That same year, 1966, Sinatra and Mia were married. However, Mia's mellow hippie style was out of step with Frank's hard-living ways, and the union only lasted for 16 months. Following the divorce and finding himself in danger of being yesterday's news, Sinatra began looking for a new musical direction that would allow him to compete with the hard-edged rock and roll that was popular at the time. He found what he was looking for in the song My Way, written by Paul Anker. The song, which Frank recorded in 1969, has become his anthem. Then, in 1970, to the shock of his legion of fans, Sinatra announced his retirement. He said that he was tired of show business and wanted nothing more than to relax, read, and think. But just as he prepared to take his life easy, life threw another curveball his way. He was summoned to a congressional hearing keen to investigate his connections with the Mafia. Lack of evidence forced the congressional committee to drop its investigation, and the heat went off Sinatra. Retirement, though, it never sat easily with Frank, and by 1973, he was once again on the comeback trail. This time, his focus would be on concert performances. He leapt back into the public consciousness with a television special called Old Blue Eyes is Back. From there, he went on to fill all of the concert halls and big arenas across the country. He sang directly to his audience, dressed in a fitted tuxedo, just as he had always done. In 1976, the 60-year-old Sinatra married for the fourth time. His bride was 45-year-old Barbara Marks. She traveled with him as he played to ever-growing crowds. By the 1980s, the chairman of the board was a bona fide icon. 
He went on to help in Ronald Reagan's campaign. Then, in 1988, the 73-year-old paired with some of his former Rat Pack performers. The audiences absolutely loved it. In 1993, Frank made use of a technological innovation to produce an album entitled Frank Sinatra Duets. He sang along with 13 top recording artists, though they were at different places and times. The record became a number one platinum bestseller and outsold any of his previous recordings. Sinatra lived out the last five years of his life in relative quiet. He was plagued by ill health, often going into hospital with cardiac complaints. Then the dementia set in. He passed away on May 14, 1998, at a hospital in Los Angeles, with the official cause of death being a heart attack. On May 15, the Empire State Building was turned blue in New York, and the casinos in Las Vegas came to a halt in a tribute to the man who, very uniquely, did it his way. So I really hope you enjoyed that episode of Biographics. If you did, there's a couple of things you could do right now. One is hit that like button below. Also, if you want more stuff like this, we put out brand new videos every Monday and every Thursday. So hit that subscribe button below. And subscribe button doesn't do what it used to on YouTube. If you actually want to get a notification about these videos, please do hit that bell button next to the subscribe button. And that'll send you a notification every time, every Monday and Thursday when we put out a new video. Also, if you want to watch something else right now, stuff from the archive, over there on the right. And as always, thank you for watching.